Welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming to this session. Uh, my name is Lee Hee Sung, the president of Intel Korea. Today, I will lead this session with our distinguished guest. It's a great honor for me to be here and have a chance to share ideas with you. We gather here to talk about creativity at workplace with the topic of breaking through the wall of conformity at workplace. We have two outstanding guests to give you an insightful presentation. We also have a two distinguished uh, panelists to discuss about the agenda. Lastly, we'll have a Q&A session from the floor if you have a time. So please don't hesitate to ask questions during the session. We have a 20 minute presentation each and then 15 minute discussion each and then about another 20 minutes for your uh, Q&A session. Before I begin, I'd like to talk about the background of this session. Recently, many companies have been suffering from sluggish economy since the global financial crisis. So the companies are facing great difficulty surviving the environment. At the same time, a, every industry is going through frequent innovation change. Some of the innovative company has been growing rapidly, with the other companies that struggle for survival. Industry experts found out that creativity is the secret of their success. Creative organization has created disruptive innovation, and they have seeking way to resolve this crisis. Also, many companies are focusing on transformation of their organization into creativity center. So this is today's agenda. We'll primarily talk about two points of se uh, other session. First, organizational operation, transforming the current organization to be more flexible. We will listen from very long, old, innovative company from very new, young, ideal company. So the second point will be also employee motivation, the people who are the core resource of the company, how we really uh, motivating those people to making more creative ideas. Uh, we have great speaker and panelists talk about the share their insight on this. The first, I'd like to introduce a speaker and uh, for the first speaker is a Scott Draw, Vice President of Human Resource from Boeing. Our second speaker is Eric Alexander, Vice President of Business Development from Fleetford. We also have distinguished panelists from He Kyung Min, uh, Executive Vice President of a CSB Executive Director from uh, CJ Group, and Won Ho Lee, Executive Vice President from Sinan Bank. Thank you for all attending today's discussion, Mr. Min and Mr. Lee. Okay, let's start first our first speaker, Mr. Scott Draw. I guess most of you already know about Boeing, but Mr. Draw doesn't mind. I'd like to give you a short briefing about Boeing, but Boeing is a, already a big company. Maybe you go first about introduce yourself. Thank you. Diversity at Boeing. I am diversity at Boeing. Diversity is important to the Boeing company because it's who we are. We are a company that values people. We're a company that values the contributions that everyone brings. I am diversity at Boeing. It's our objective as we chart the course for Boeing to drive inclusion and mutual respect into every corner of this enterprise. Having a diverse workforce at Boeing improves our products in that we are now utilizing all of the skills of all of our people. Diversity helps us build these great airplanes. We have people from all different walks of life, with all different experiences, and they each contribute different things to the company. I am diversity at Boeing. I have a Native American background. I spent 20 years in the Navy. I have experience in aviation outside of Boeing. That is the diversity that I bring to the Boeing product. My team has made up a variety of people with short and long service, recent college hires, I have been with Boeing for a year and a month now. 16 years. About 28 years now. I've worked at Boeing for 57 years. Coming from a background from Tunisia, uh, I've known of Boeing since I was a little kid. It's the best company in the world. People working with the Boeing company and live in different countries in the world. And uh, this diversity is the foundation of creation best products. In Australia, you really get a sense of being part of something that's bigger, that's global, and is changing the world in really amazing ways. You hear different languages on the hallways. You speak 
with different accents all the time. I personally from Brazil. I am diversity at Boeing. It's important that our employees reflect that global diversity um, that exists in the real world. Working with Boeing, I feel part of uh, a global team. We have to recognize that each one of us is diverse. In many ways, we're similar. In many ways, we're different, but we're all diverse. I am diversity at Boeing. I think there's many different kinds of diversity. Um, there's the obvious diversity that you, know, you and I look different, which would be age, race, gender, but then diversity of thought, communication, diversity of you know, how we interact with each other. One of the best things about Boeing is the collective nature of how we work together in the company. So it could mean where you normally would have a team with just engineers, that you then include some mechanics on that team as well. Maybe people with different skills and different backgrounds to make sure that you have people looking at the situation who can bring a different perspective. I am diversity at Boeing. When we learn to celebrate our own strengths and skills and value others, we're able to feel like we belong. Affinity Groups bring to the company their unique life experience, their unique way of seeing the world. I'm involved with the Boeing Black Employees Association Affinity Group, and believe me, diversity is my passion. One of the affinity groups with Beagles, I've been able to go to Food Outreach, which is an AIDS and cancer food packing service. I got involved with affinity groups because it helps break down barriers, promotes a culture of understanding. Every month we celebrate diversity. This month we're celebrating the Ability Awareness Month. Today is all about just celebrating the many different abilities that people bring to the workplace. Instead of walking in someone else's shoes, I rolled in someone else's chair, and it's a different perspective. Everyone is welcome here. Soy la diversidad en Boy. The very word diversity makes me proud because that is what I stand for. I am diversity at Boeing. If we work together, we can create things in reality that others have only been able to dream about. Diversity at Boeing brings a great tenacity to our company. The message is clear, and I think everyone is understanding that we all our diversity and more. Thank you, HS. I uh, really appreciate being here. Uh, I'm Scott Draw, as HS indicated, and I have uh, five things that I want to cover with you today. The first of all, we'll start out with a, a little bit of a glance and a snapshot of the Boeing company in addition to the video. From there, I want to share with you uh, kind of how we're trying to work together to uh, talk about Boeing in a global marketplace. Number two. Number three, we'll talk about um, Boeing's ability to work within and beyond those walls of conformity and where we're placing our bets to make sure that we're continued to be, we're almost 100 years old, but when we become 200 years old. And then finally, uh, we're going to talk about how we put people first and why that's a key part of our long-range people plan. And I'll end with a couple of examples of, okay, I've heard you, but how have you put that in action? And I'll share with you a couple of situations, a couple of the actions that we've taken, and then some of the results that we're seeing from working beyond the walls of conformity. So let's get started. Okay, Boeing at a glance. Uh, many of you may know the Boeing company. Today, we're a, a very large manufacturer of uh, commercial aircraft, support those aircraft, and uh, have been in business since 19, uh, 1916 is when we were first organized. We have 170,000 employees employed in 170 countries around the globe. And today, our stock is at an all-time high. It's at $133. Um, we have a market cap of about $100 billion. We have 750 million shares outstanding, and it's been a great year for the Boeing company. Uh, we have annual sales currently of about $81 billion, and that number is going to go up. Uh, so it's a great time to be in Boeing. We have a lot of tremendous pressures on us 
for cost reasons and competitive reasons. We'll get into that as I share a couple of examples. So uh, where is Boeing in terms of a global marketplace? You know, we're a big player, and as the video shows, we, can, we feel that you can only be competitive when you can draw the best people from all over the place, no matter where they are in the world, and where we create an environment where people can feel free and comfortable to have their voices heard. Because if we just create diversity in and of itself, that's not gonna help us be competitive. But when we add diversity and inclusion to the table, that's where the power happens, right? Because we've gotta set an environment as the HR professionals and the leaders of the company to make sure that all voices are heard. The voice that may be afraid to raise their hand to say, you know, I had a better idea, or can I ask a question? And so one of the key things that we really talk about a lot at Boeing is making sure that all voices can be heard in a very safe work environment. So what are we doing to con uh, avoid conformity? You know, it'd be easy for me to come up and talk with you and say, you know, we're, we're a pretty old company, we're stodgy, uh, we're, we're not very innovative, and uh, we're just happy to be here. Uh, but that's not the company that the Boeing company is. It is an extremely vibrant, exciting place, uh, both on the commercial side of the business and on the defense side of the business. For example, on the commercial side of the business, we have seven years, seven years of backlog in our aircraft. So if you wanted to buy a plane today, you would have to wait probably five or six years before your plane would come. Now imagine if you were buying a car and the, the salespeople said you have to wait five or six years. You wouldn't be too happy about that, would you? So we have this constant pressure of making sure we increase uh, productivity and increase the rate of the production of our aircraft. On the defense side of the business, uh, defense, space, and security, where I currently work, it's an exciting time to be there. It's, we're under a tremendous amount of pressure from a cost perspective, given the U.S. defense budget cutbacks and defense cutbacks around the world. But I'll tell you, it's not a place that's uh, sad. It's a place where people are thriving. We just completed our employee opinion survey results. And even on the defense side of the business, where there's tremendous pressure to reduce cost, um, we had employee survey scores that went up on our engagement score by four points. And that's statistically significant. And many of the scores across the board increased. And, as a, and to put things in context, we have on the defense side of the business 59,000 employees, and we received over 20,000 comments for the employee survey. It was more than 2,297 pages. I know that because I'm reading it right now, okay? Now, how do we at Boeing try to, especially on the defense side of the business, what's our strategy? What's our strategy to continue to build the incredible products and services that our people deliver to the U.S. and our allies around the world? And I'll tell you, it's very simple. It's putting people first and our customers always, because we can't have one without the other. When we say people first at the Boeing company, we're really talking about four things. It doesn't mean that it's the safest place in the world and we're not gonna have tough times, but what it does mean is that we're gonna create an environment where a person can come to work and they're gonna be challenged, they're gonna have meaningful work, and they're gonna be developed. Uh, for example, in my own career, I started the Boeing Company 24 years ago as a college intern and have moved several times in several different locations, both on the defense and the commercial side of the business. So development is a key part of what we're talking about when we talk about people first. The second element is engagement. I shared with you a little bit about the employee opinion survey results. It's really, really important that we as leaders of organizations listen to our employees and not just listen, but respond to what they have to say. Because when people feel like, hey, my voice has been heard, but not only has it been heard, they actually did something about it. That's very, very motivating to all employees. The next element is well-being. You know, we've, we have a strong push for uh, a greater emphasis on well-being. On one hand, it helps our cost 
because of it makes healthier employees, but on the other side of the equation, it makes employees feel better, it makes a better family life, and it makes for a more productive employee. And then the fourth point on our people first strategy is employees involved in the community. Because we feel like the community is what gives us our license to operate. No matter what community we work in, whether that's Seoul or South Africa or anywhere in the world, we feel like being a good corporate citizen is, gives us license to operate in that environment. So that's what People First is about. And then finally, I, I told you I would share with you a couple of examples of, hey, uh, understand what you're saying, but could you give me some examples of how you're applying uh, the, these people strategies in a way that's making a difference for the company? Let me give you three real quick. The first example is an example of our 787. The 787 is a game-changing aircraft. It's an incredible aircraft that's phenomenal, okay? But when we started, the situation was we went out and our engineers, and we have lots of engineers, and we have close to 50,000 engineers at Boeing, and so engineers like to design things. And so they came up with this concept that they were gonna build a fast airplane. So we came up with something called the Sonic Cruiser. The Sonic Cruiser was gonna be something that uh, flew at almost the speed of sound. It would get to there a lot faster, and it was a really cool design. But when we went out and talked to our customers, they said, you know, we don't want a fast plane, we want an efficient plane. And so what we did is we came up with the 787. It's 20% lighter. It's a significant uh, reduction in terms of the noise that, that comes with the aircraft. It's a much more pleasant environment because it's built out of, out of a composite material instead of aluminum. That allows us to, redu you know, to reduce the pressure, and so when we go on long flights, people don't feel as fatigued as they are. So our customers said, hey, and most importantly, you know, we need a plane that we can, you know, it's going to help us make money, and it's going to be a better experience for our customers. And so we came up with a 787. And uh, to give an example, so what were the results? The results of the 787 example is we had our employees listen to the customers, come in, bring a tremendous number of innovations into that aircraft. It, it generally an airplane, if, they, if you build a thousand airplanes, that's you know, like world class, okay? Uh, for example, the, se the 747, we introduced the 747 in 1969, it went into service in 1970. There's been approximately 1,500 747s built at the Boeing company. The 787, which is just starting to roll out, we have orders for more than 850 already, and it's just getting started. So a great example of how our people are moving beyond those walls of conformity. Let me give you a second example. The second example comes from our defense business. As you saw in the video, we build cool stuff. Uh, some of the things we build are rockets that launch satellites, and we also build satellites. Now, both of these propositions are extremely costly. Um, and so we, our engineers in El Segundo have come up with a way of, instead of typically what happens where one customer buys one satellite, and then that satellite has to get launched on a vehicle, and these things cost a lot of money, what if we could fractionalize the transponders on the satellites so we could sell part of a satellite to one company and another part to another company and that it's a better value for everyone? And you know, our customers are loving it and our satellite business is one of the fastest growing areas of the commercial, uh, of our defense company today. So that's a, a second example of where um, we're listening to our customers, using innovation through our employees by putting them first and redeploying that in the marketplace. And then finally, uh, one example on cost. We have a program called market-based affordability on the defense side of the business because we know our customers uh, want more for less. Uh, in the U.S., the U.S. government has a program called Better Buying Power 2.0. 
and it's really about creating more value. And we know that there are times when we do things that doesn't always add value. So how do you wring the value out of the cost equation? And I'll tell you that our employees have put their minds together and over the past probably three or four years have reduced our cost on the defense side of the business, which is a business of $33 billion, have wrung out $3 billion worth of cost. So close to 10% of the cost in an environment where most of the time cost is going up. So there's another great example of how we're using our people to say, help us think through what's the most cost efficient and effective way to deliver products and services to our customers. Three examples. Thank you for uh, listening to me today. I'll turn it back over to you, HS. Thank you, Scott. Let's give him a big hand for Scott for his great presentation. I totally agree with him about the people first things. Yeah, he's a company, a diversity uh, a program to really listen to all the people who want to say something to the company. And whether it is a uh, cost reduction or innovation, I really like the company, seven years bang, no, kind of program. So seven years a business really proven, I like those. But anyway, it is company more like a keyword and more like a people first diversity. And throughout those, the company keep uh, maintaining their uh, innovation and creativity in the company. Thank you. Again, our next speaker, our first speaker is a hundred, almost 100 years old company. Now we having a very new bond company, uh, Flipper, the, uh, Mr. Uh, Eric Alexander. Welcome, Eric Alexander, with your big hands. Thanks. Annyeonghaseyo. Uh, <laughs> it's great to be here today. Uh, uh, thanks everyone for coming, um, and thanks Scott for for a great talk. Um, yeah, we're the other end of the spectrum um, of Boeing and some of the other companies that are that are represented here. Um, Flipboard's about three years old now. Um, uh, our business is growing incredibly rapidly. We're at about uh, close to a hundred million users right now, and. Um, it's, uh, uh, you know, we're still very young, though. Um, uh, I don't have 100 years of history, um, as, uh, as Scott does. Um, but, you know, I think a lot of the things that he said are very relevant, and, and I'll talk about some similar things. Um, so the first thing is, I just want to ask the audience, how many of you in the audience have ever heard of Flipboard, have ever used Flipboard? Okay, so we got a few. Um, so what I want to do is, um, I'll talk a little bit, I'll give a, a quick demo of the product, I'll play a video um, and talk a little bit about that, but let me first tell you a little bit about how the whole thing started. So uh, Flipboard, um, we're big thinkers. Mike McHugh, our CEO, um, you know, set out to solve a really big problem. Um, and the problem that we wanted to solve was that we thought the web had turned into a really ugly place um, over the last 15 years. Mike and I are old guys in Silicon Valley, and we were at Netscape uh, very early on. And the web browser had turned into um, something that was <clears throat> very difficult for publishers to make money. Um, the web had turned into a place where it was very difficult for publishers to make money, where it wasn't a pretty experience for consumers. And this problem got even worse when you added on the fact that more and more people were accessing content um, through their mobile devices. And so we said, okay, if we could delete the internet entirely and start all over again, um, how would we do it? And um, this is, it was really big thinking. And so we need to solve big problems, get great people, and really have a lot of creativity in the company to not get stuck in old ways and think differently. Um, so let me give you an example. Um, this is an example of what, um, this was a cover story from Time Magazine. And as you can see, um, what ends up happening here is the cover and the picture, it's beautiful. And the publisher did an amazing job of writing a great headline. And there's this beautiful imagery that really calls your, calls your attention to it. Um, and you can do that in print. You can do these wonderful, beautiful layouts. But then when you move this same same uh, content to the digital world, it has to appear in a web browser. 
And so the first thing you have with a web browser is this navigation bar. And then the second thing is, of course, the publishers have to have a site. And so there's site navigation. And then, of course, the publishers have to make money. And what happens then? This big, beautiful story that was the centerpiece of everything gets moved down to a very small piece of the page. And we didn't think this was good for the consumer. Um, and we didn't think this is good for the publisher either. Um, and the publisher was always trading a dollar in print for a dime in digital. So there was a bunch of big problems to solve here. And we really wanted to make readers happy. Um, so we built what we call is a personal magazine, which is Flipboard. And Flipboard integrates all of your social networks. And we also integrate with about 8,000 publishers across the globe. And we work with them to make their content look beautiful on mobile devices without them having to do a lot of work. Let me give a quick video demo of, um, of what Flipboard is um, so you guys can see what it is. And then I would hope all you guys try to download the app. And actually, um, there's a great magazine um, that, that was built actually for this forum that you can actually access in Flipboard. And uh, we can probably show you guys how to do that later. Um, so let me play this video. Staring down at me, I am stumbling. I call you on the phone to tell you that I love you, but I'm mumbling. The clock inside my head comes ticking to a halt as I. Okay. So um, what's really important to us, as you can see, is we try to make things look beautiful. Um, beauty is really, really important. And um, it requires a lot of creativity in order to come up with something like that. Um, while the product looks very simple, um, it was very difficult to do. And um, we had to get a lot out of our employees. So let me talk to you about how we built the company and how we get uh, creativity out of our employees and how we try to eliminate all the barriers um, from, that, from that process. So the first thing obviously starts with you got to hire great people. And um, it was every year in, in the US, we have a Thanksgiving lunch with all of the employees. And we asked everyone, we said, how many people were actually born outside of the United States? And more than 50% of our employees were actually born outside of the US. So we have a really diverse culture. Um, and the reason I point that out is that when we try to hire people, um, you know, Stanford University, Berkeley, they're right nearby. Um, Stanford University is a mile away. So we could recruit a lot of engineers from Stanford, but we think it's really important to have a lot of different types of folks. And so when we want to hire a designer, we find the best designer in the world. And um, we've got some of the best in the world. And Marcos happened to be um, from Japan. Uh, DDA was from, uh, from Europe. Um, and a lot of our engineers, they're from all over the world. And we seek them out to find them. And I think great, um, you know, the great businesses start with hiring A-plus players in the beginning and trying to continue to do that. So first thing we did was try to hire the best people and leaders in the company um, that can help bring us, uh, bring us forward. Um, the second thing was actually creating an environment that really fosters creativity. Um, this is an example of our first little office, which was tiny. It was in an um, art gallery, um, speaking of creativity. And um, we actually thought that um, it was really important to have an environment that has no walls. Um, there's none in the building. And now we've had to move three times um, since we've started the company three years ago because um, we've grown from you know, a tiny two-person company into 100 people. Uh, but one of the things that's really important to us is actually finding the right workspace. 
Um, it really makes a difference with the employees and how they think and how they interact with each other and how we actually get solutions from them. Um, we also wanted to give everyone, in addition to a great place to work, we, we don't dictate to the employees what kind of hardware, software they have to use. We're really open. So when an employee comes in, if they love an Apple, they can go get an Apple. If they love a Microsoft computer, uh, they love uh, Windows, they can go get a Windows PC. Um, every employee gets a, a headset because the challenge with the open environment is, of course, it can be noisy. And so we, everybody goes either down to the Apple store and they buy a, uh, uh, a laptop and a set of Bose headphones. Um, and, and that's how we get around the noise factor. Um, and in our office, uh, the, the headphones essentially mean the same thing as someone closing the door in their office, that they're busy. Um, so that's the do not disturb sign, essentially. Um, so um, we really try to you know, give employees the best tools, whatever they want to do. Um, our IT department is very small, and um, they don't dictate a lot. The employees actually dictate what they want to use, um, which I'm sure is different than a lot of big companies. Um, we also felt it was really important in order to attract really good talent to create a learning environment. You know, some of the young engineers that, um, that we hire, one of the reasons they want to come to work for a company like Flipboard where, you know, while the employees are incented with stock options, um, they may not make as much salary as in a lot of other offers from big companies. For example, a Google. Um, Google may offer them a lot more money um, and Google's turned into a big company. It's still a fantastic place to work, but um, you don't always get access to all of the thought leaders in the company. And so we really try to create the environment where both our interns and our young engineers are really encouraged to learn. And at the same time, we've really tried to, um, <coughs> tried to you know, encourage the employees to teach as well. So for example, I mentioned DDA before. Uh, the, the guy on the left, DDA, is one of our lead designers. And DDA loves to teach people and share his knowledge about how he designs software. And it's really nice as we try to recruit and hire folks because they get access to people like DDA that is pretty famous on the internet. People know him. They know our other designer, Marcos. And the fact that when they're coming on board that you know they know that they can go take a walk with DDA and ask a lot of questions, um, it helps us as a company um, because we give those employees access to people like DDA because the young 24-year-old uh, engineer that we just hired um, has really interesting ways to solve problems, and DDA can learn from him too. Um, and I think that that's really a big thing in our company that we've tried to do to help foster creativity. Um, this is a picture of a couple of uh, younger employees. Actually, I think these are a couple of interns that we had this summer. And what, what this is our coffee bar. And we try to create this like community space where people can go, and uh, the guy um, on the right is leaning against a big open table coffee bar where people are encouraged, and, and we put food there every day. There's food there in the morning. Um, Vicki, who manages our office, is very, you know, she's very healthy. She makes sure that all employees get super healthy food. She won't buy soda for anybody, um, you know, so if you want to go get soda, you have to go get your own. Um, but this is a place where people go and walk over and have coffee. And for a guy like me, I run the international business and business development. I spend a lot of time out of the office. And when I show back up in the, uh, show up in the office for a week at a time, I solve a lot of problems right here at this coffee bar. Um, because I'll meet some of the employees, and instead of having to call a big meeting, um, I may say, hey, guys, what do you think about this? I just got back from Korea, and we should do this product integration, or we should launch these publishers. And I see the guy that runs um, the back end, um, and he sits, you know, right, he's sitting at the coffee bar having an espresso, and we get a lot done in five minutes' time. And if we didn't have that collaborative workspace where people are comfortable and they're just going to kind of go sit down, I might not actually solve some of those problems because I might not set that meeting up on the calendar. And I might not, um, and, and, and so I think just having that there really makes a difference. Um, 
we also think it's really important to make work fun. Um, and so we have ping pong table, um, ping pong tables. Um, everyone's super competitive. Um, and you know, you want the office to be a place where people want to come there. Um, not a place where they have to come there. And so um, we really encourage people to play. Um, we have sports teams. Um, and, you know, it's just it's more fun um, when you have fun at the office. And the way we get a lot of, you know, a, a worker that is not happy is not creative. And our business thrives only on creativity. Um, you know, people definitely recognize us as the thought leaders in this, in this space that we're in of mobile reading. And um, we've really changed the way that people access content, and it required huge amounts of creativity. And it's really difficult to achieve that if people aren't having fun at work. So we really try to make that a big piece of our culture. Um, of course, you know, we like to say it's a place to smile. If you go into the Flipboard office, you do see people smiling all the time. These are some of the interns this summer having a really good time actually solving a problem that we gave them. Um, they all sat down on the couch and worked on it. Um, and so it's a place to have fun and, and smile. Um, another big thing that we think in terms of um, achieving creativity um, and, and not being uh, conformist is we have to have an open door policy. So, you know, a lot of companies, I work with big companies sometimes where it's very interesting. I find that maybe a manager is not allowed to call their boss's boss. They're actually not allowed to talk to them. And to me, it's, it's, it's mind boggling. I don't understand how problem gets solved. And while, um, and for us, it's really, really important to have an open door policy to all of the managers um, and have a really flat organization. So here, that's Mike, our CEO, and Josh Quitner. Um, Josh we hired from, Josh is not a Silicon Valley guy. He comes from a traditional publishing background. And he was one of our early hires at Flipboard, uh, going back to hiring great people that are very diverse and different. And Josh comes from one of those big companies, big publishing company that had a lot of structure. Um, that had rules like you can't talk to your manager's manager. And um, he was one of the things he loved about Flipboard is, you know, he could talk to anyone. He could talk to his boss, the CEO, my boss, the CEO, or, um, you know, he, he could talk to the most junior person in the organization. And that junior person a lot of times gave him really good ideas on how to solve problems that he would tell you he would never have fixed if we didn't have these open rules. Um, it just wouldn't happen. Um, Mike, our CEO, he's always smiling. Um, he is super accessible. Um, again, the most junior employee in the company can walk up to Mike and go for a walk with him. Mike's uh, very Steve Jobs-like. He loves to solve problems when he walks. And so our office is right in downtown Palo Alto. And usually my meetings with Mike consist of us walking around the block and grabbing a coffee. And, and we try not to have big hour-long meetings in the office. We solve a lot more in 15 minutes and of walking around the block than we do. Um, and, and, and short meetings um, and, and making sure that the executives are accessible I think is really, really important um, and something to think about in all your companies as well. Um, sometimes we drag things out too long. Um, in a two-hour meeting, people have lost attention and um, you're not solving any problems at that point. And so we really try to encourage short meetings and, um, and you know, quick access to the CEO and, other man and other, all the other vice presidents of the company. Um, Mike, this is, uh, Mike's back there, he's a little blurry, but you see his desk looks like everyone else's. He sits right there among everyone. And, um, uh, he's just another one of us. And so there's no big office with a door that's um, intimidating for a young employee to um, kind of walk up and talk to Mike about an idea. He just sits right there. He's got headphones like everyone else with the do not disturb sign, but um, he's right there. And I think that that's really, really important. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about creativity, and then I know I'm probably going to run out of time here shortly. So. Um, one of the things, so this is a picture of our design wall. 
One of the things that we do, all of the Flipboard design, while we're a software company, um, we actually love to use paper to design things. And Marcos, um, who's the tall guy there, um, Marcos is a really, um, he's a very famous designer. If you look him up on, online, Marcos Westcamp, you'll see he has exhibits in art museums. Um, he's done amazing infographics. He's amazing at figuring out ways of how to display information. And here, um, the reason I wanted to bring this up is this design wall is, is an open wall in the company. A lot of companies really hide secrets and next projects that they're working on. And we actually open those things up to everyone. And so now we have to be careful. I mean, this isn't displayed in our window facing, uh, facing the street so people can come look at it. Um, but what this does is this is actually a picture of Marcos talking to one of the young engineers and he's describing what he's designing for the next version of Flipboard. And this young engineer is asking him a lot of questions about, Marcos, why are you doing this this way? And um, Marcos gets a lot of great feedback from all of the employees, including even business people like me sometimes will come up and I'll ask a silly question to Marcos and say, Marcos, why do we do this this way? Can we do this? And he'll say, oh, that's a really good idea. And then he'll go take that to the nth degree and he'll make it so much better than my idea or someone else's in the office. And if we didn't have a wall like this that everyone could access, I think it would really be different because all of a sudden the designs would be done and then it's too late to change. And so, you know, while this creates problems because everyone likes to put their two cents into the product, it's a really good healthy process that we have and helps us um, make great software at the end of the day. Um, you know, again, we're really into the collaborative problem solving. So while we do have this very open workspace, um, we also, um, you know, it's important to have conference rooms where people can lock themselves up in and work on big problems. And so um, we really encourage, while, while we encourage shorter meetings, um, we really encourage collaboration. And this is actually, um, this summer when we had a bunch of interns in, we gave them some really hard problems to solve. And these were all very bright computer science um, uh, uh, students. And they did an amazing job you know, accessing our people in solving some really interesting problems that frankly, we might not have approached the way that they did. They had really young minds on it and they weren't worried about the barriers that we had. They worked in utopia, they worked in a perfect world. Um, and then we were able to figure out a way to bring those ideas and those solutions into the product. Um, another thing we do is on our product forum meetings. So every week we have a product forum where um, everyone's invited in the company if they wanna come. Marketing people, product people, engineering people, everyone's allowed to come. Um, and this is where the, all of the product managers review and talk about what we're planning to do in the product. And, you know, having all of these people in the company there, it's really actually really helpful. And it's an open forum where people can question why we're putting these features in the product um, and say that maybe we should be working on something different. So it's a challenging environment. And that's one of the things you know, I want to emphasize is that we really encourage our employees to challenge us. Um, we're not always right. We're wrong all the time, and it's okay. Um, and so we really say, okay, if we're going to build these five features into the product, sometimes people ask great questions like, well, why wouldn't we do this instead of that feature? It seems like that's gonna get used a lot more. And, you know, our product people are very, very smart, but sometimes we miss stuff. And other people, by having these product forums that are very open, um, it really encourages our people to think creatively and not be blocked by a process to get their ideas into the product. And, um, this is another, so this meeting is really popular. This is our Friday meeting, and we call it Mock O'Clock. And Mock O'Clock, um, A, we serve beer there, so it's always very popular. Um, and it's on a Friday afternoon. And what Mock O'Clock is, is this is where anyone in the company that has an idea, they can present that idea. And as you see, 
the, the, the two, two guys sitting at the table at the end there, that's Mike, our CEO, and the other one is a guy named Eric Feng, who is our CTO. And a ton, we have tons of engineers, product people, different people in the background, and this forum is allowed, an engineer is allowed to come in and they can hack up a prototype of something that they want to do. And then they present that idea to the whole company. And so instead of the typical process that a lot of companies have where um, if you have an idea, you send it to your manager, maybe your manager doesn't like that idea, or maybe there's some office politics that keep you from implementing that idea. Well, this is a forum where anyone can stand up and take that podium and show off what they, what they can do or what they want to do. And all of a sudden, an idea that might have been hidden um, through a process and um, through you know, conforming, to, uh, to conforming to a process, all of a sudden that idea can get brought to life. And, um, and this is a really popular, heavily attended meeting, and it creates this great competitive spirit too among the engineers where they all try to outdo each other. And they're always trying to come up with the next cool thing, and you wanna get on the mock o'clock agenda. Um, and we've gotten great ideas for the product and implemented them just because of this meeting. Um, so I think, um, Another one that we do very similar is the weekly huddle, where every week, and again, this is a very short meeting, this is 15 minutes, and everyone in the company stands in the room, and we mic there's a microphone, and there's a very brief agenda. Everyone spends a couple minutes kind of reviewing what the company's priorities are, what we're working on, if there's been any big problems, um, how we're gonna solve them, and again, this is only a 15-minute meeting. This is not an all-day company off-site. This is a 15-minute, we call it a huddle, like an American football huddle, where we very quickly get together and we talk about what we're going to do, how we're going to execute on that, and, um, and, and make that happen. So I think I'm getting close on time, right? So um, why don't, uh, the last one is we do a monthly all hands where we actually do have everyone there and that monthly all hands meeting is a little longer. So um, I think you've heard a lot about like how we structured the company and how we really try to achieve creativity and, um, and, and not be conformist and not have big policies in place that can really squelch those efforts. Thank you, Eric. Hey, give him a big round of applause. Thank you. What Eric uh, delivers is much more like a trio old young baby company uh, uh, hiring a very talented uh, people, making them work in a very open cultural environment and making them having an idea of new things. Uh, they confront each other, sharing uh, each other. And I think it is the openness is a key of this company too. Compared to it, he is a trio old company. I mean, in Intel is about 40 jumps, just 40 years, more than 40 years old. But culturally, we are almost the same. Uh, w Intel, we always saying that a flat organization, we have a same queue, whether it's a CEO or just every employee. But they have a more often, they are just a no cubicle even. They have a much smaller space they uh, share together. It is much more like a small baby venture company uh, growing fast. And they need to really make a quick decision making. So they are really showing a idea and creativity role model small companies uh, case. Thank you. And let's go to our panel discussion. The first uh, panelist, uh, 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 panelist is a uh, mini Gyeong from uh, CJ Corp. Uh, if you think of creativity, uh, what's coming in uh, your mind in the first thing as uh, many guys think about is entertainment from uh, CJ Corp from point of view. And uh, CJ is a company who ha which has a traditional manufacturing, uh, like a food and beverage uh, company. They also have a, a creative industry, uh, like a uh, retail home shopping and entertainment business. So I really are uh, eager to learn about a CJ Cobb's approach in managing and motivating employee to boost workplace creativity. As I was hearing Eric's presentation, I mean, first of all, I want to work for Eric's company, and secondly, we have a long way to go. But I think uh, what's important is the company has grown from a food company uh, with a 60 years 
history. And I think we are mostly recognized as a contents provider, which is a less than 20-year-old company. Uh, in entertainment side, we actually range from game, movie, uh, music, um, theater, uh, musical. So we are very, very diverse in uh, contents, and no one questions about the importance of creativity there. However, our traditional business uh, in food manufacturing, and we are also the one of the number one licensed uh, bioproduct uh, product producer in the world. Uh, we face different kind of pr uh, creativity problem. That's the innovation. So I think throughout the whole company, uh, the creativity is the key. And our challenge is how do you actually foster those challenges when the company is changing and uh, growing at the same time? We have a Korean cultural problem. So it's uh, um, we do recognize in early on that uh, in order to be successful, we have to encourage diversity, openness, um, and flat organization, which in intuitively very contradictory to Korean culture. We had to come up with a few solutions, and the one of the, I mean, the approaches that we thought that we probably needed a more systematic solution than, um, you know, the companies from let's say, Silicon Valley. And one of the reasons, um, I mean, you know, it's the, there are many shy young employees. Uh, many of them actually would not voice their great ideas because of the shyness or also, you know, in the culture like us, uh, they don't want to be considered as a protruding nail. So in those, uh, we had to come up with the, some of the, um, the ways that the company is sending a very strong message to the employees that we do care uh, each individual ideas. We do like to encourage the creativity. So the then second one is that in order to really uh, reinforce the message, we had to create the system to reward the good ideas. And those are, uh, we have a two, we have a four actually, um, those competition, but two of them are most distinctively, one is the only one fair. That's for the uh, new employees. We hire about 1,000, 1,000 couple of hundred college graduates. And then after their former um, entry training, then they have a six weeks to a month long idea competition. So there they are actually formed or teamed with uh, different areas such as someone from logistics business might team up with uh, someone from movie business and then they have to come up with the idea. It could be anything non-related, neither of them. And then uh, the other one is the only one showcase. These are for the um, more, these are not for the new entrants. These are for the people who, you know, could be anyone, could be executive, although no executive ever entered the competition, from executive to any young employees. And also the ideas does not have to be in the industry that they are working on. So those two, we have uh, layers of competition and then they are rewarded. So these are the sort of the former uh, system that we would like to foster the creativity within the organization. And then the other thing is um, we also try to change the culture. One is that we got rid of all the honorifics. So in, in this company, in, in CJ, we owe everyone's name. So the group chairman is Lee jae uh, The new employee is Lee young joon -nim. So it's uh, everyone is a name, and in fact, when we talk to outside people, we still use the titles. So you know, outside I'm Min Bu Sajang name, but in the company I'm Min Hee Kyung name. So that's uh, we've been doing that over ten years, and then you know there are the sometimes that um, it seems harder, but we've never given up. There are other several other Korean companies who try the same system, but I think. Uh, 
the longest I heard is like three, four years, and they've given up and sort of reverted back to the old system. So that's something that uh, we try for the flat organization. And I think finally, uh, since a month ago, what I've been doing, uh, my new role within the company is not HR anymore. It's uh, creating shared service, um, uh, shared value. And here, I think my biggest challenge is actually bringing uh, creativity outside the company into our system, and then we work as a one ecosystem. So for example, we are doing uh, many competitions for young screenwriters or young movie scriptwriters, and then after reviewing, when it's selected, we actually make a movie and we show in our uh, theaters. So these are the things that uh, and then some of them may end up working with us within the company, or some of them may stay outside the company, but working within the, uh, the same ecosystem and then making it larger is our goal. So, and I just wanted to mention that uh, Eric must have done a really good job because I realized that I was using the flipboard even without knowing that I was using a clip flipboard. So. Thank Great, you. you have a customer here. <laughs> okay, thank you, uh, EVP Mr. Min. And our, a, you want a question? Our second panelist is a uh, one only uh, executive vice president from Sinan Bank. Normally when I think about bank is we easily assume that it doesn't associate with innovation. Uh, we have a perception that bank has the most uh, stable and secure organizational structure but Shinan Bank has been driving innovation for a long time. Shinan Bank is known to create and adapt a new process and system to give creativity into the workplace. It has been gathering an idea from every single employee and took a risk to implement them. Uh, Shinan Bank become icon of innovation of bank industry in Korea. I also want to get some insight from implementing innovation idea from risk and transformation of internal organization. Ms. Lee. Shinan 어, 오늘날 신한행이 이렇게 오기까지 뭐 조그마한 그런 역할을 했다고 생각합니다. 오늘 이렇게 귀중한 자리에 에, 저희가 저 신한행을 대표들이 참석해서 저희 사례와 함께 토론할 수 있게 돼서 굉장히 기쁘게 생각합니다. 특히 에, 고잉사라든지 플립보드 또 CJ 에, 이 훌륭한 그 회사들의 에, 이런 사례를 들을 때마다 아 매우 기쁘고 또 매우 좀 그런 시간이 참 감사하다 이러는 그 느낌을 받고 저희 또한 조그마한 그런 도움이 됐으면 하는 마음에서 몇 가지 말씀을 드릴까 합니다. 어, 저희 신한은행은 1982년에 그 창립을 했습니다. 불과 이제 30년 남짓 이렇게 된 은행인데 30년 만에 지금 그 총자산이 350조 원이고요. 어, 전 세계 15개국에 65개 도시에 그 저희 영업 거점을 이렇게 가지고 있는 그래서 이제 글로벌 기업으로 현재 성장해 가고 있는 그런 한국을 대표하는 은행 중에 하나로 이렇게 그 성장을 했습니다. 이 짧은 기간에 이러한 그 은행으로 성장할 수 있었던 그런 그 배경에는 시작부터가 저희는 시작의 모토가 새로운 금융 문화의 창조였습니다. 새로운 금융 문화의 창조가 저희 시작의 모토였습니다. 대한민국의 과거의 그런 그 전통적인 은행에서 벗어나서 어, 은행다운 은행. 에, 글로벌하게 세계로 나갈 수 있는 그런 그 새로운 은행 또 그것이 모범이 돼서 한국의 은행들의 은행 그 금융의 어떤 변화를 이끌어갔으면 좋겠다라는 그런 그 염원을 담아서 은행의 이름도 신한 뉴코리아였습니다. 에, 그런 그 새로운 금융 문화를 그 창조해야 되겠다라는 것을 저희의 사명 미션으로 해서 어, 창립된 그런 은행이고 어, 
그 은행을 오늘날 그 기대에 부응하게 이렇게 지금 키워오고 있다고 생각을 합니다. 그런데 은행업은 기본적으로 이 효율성을 추구하는 그런 그 산업입니다. 예, 뭐 말씀드리자면 그 이자의 차라든지 수수료, 작은 수수료 이런 거에 의해서 푼돈 영업이라고 할까요? 이렇게 하는 그 곳이죠. 그런데 오늘 발표를 이렇게 들어보면 보잉사 같은 경우에는 에, 이 비행기가 7, 8, 7 사례 말씀해 주셨는데 이런 그큰 제품 하나 잘 만들면 그것이 큰 이익을 창출하고 또 플립보드 같은 경우에는 정말 그 참신한 아이디어 그 아이디어로서 커다란 이익을 그 만들어낼 수 있는 막 그런 산업이지만 은행 산업은 그거랑은 조금 달라다 그럼에도 불구하고 그 작은 작은 영업 속에서의 그 혁신 창의가 거기에 발휘되지 않으면 은행은 경쟁 위에 설 수가 없다는 걸 저희 잘 알고 있습니다. 그래서 저희 초기부터 이 창의성의 부분을 아까 그 저희의 문화의 그이 미션으로 삼았다고 말씀드렸습니다만은 그걸 바탕으로 해서 지금까지 해오고 있고 근데 그 중에서 제가 강조해서 말씀드리고 싶은 것은 저희의 모토가 문화의 모토 중에 하나가 저 신한행을 그 평가하는 말 중에 하나가 평범한 사람들이 만드는 비범한 조직이다 이렇게 평가를 받고 있습니다. 신한은행을 구성한 직원들은 사실은 저희가 아까 플립보드 사장님께서는 그 지금 훌륭한 위대한 직원을 뽑아서 위대한 회사를 만든다고 말씀하셨는데 그러면 참 좋겠는데 은행의 수많은 인원을 그런 사람으로 채울 수는 없다. 그러니까 수많은 그 평범한 사람들이 가서 일할 수밖에 없는 그런 조직인데 그런 사람들을 어떻게 비범한 조직을 만드는 그런 그 일원으로서 활동하게 할수 있을 것인가가 저희의 과제였습니다. 에, 그것은 이 우리는 그 사람 속에 있는 내재된 힘, 잠재된 역량을 믿었고 그 역량을 어떻게 그 이끌어내서 키워갈 것인가 하는 것과 저희의 그 과제였습니다. 지금 각자의 열정과 또 능력, 그것을 최대한 이끌어내는 것이 저희 경영의 목표였고 그것이 저희는 생각하기엔 창의적 조직은 뭐 그의 다름 아닌 다른 표현이 아니다 이렇게 생각합니다. 뭐 그런 과정에서 어 저희는 그 이런 이질적인 그런 여러, 여러 저희 초기에 보면 여러 각 은행에서 모인 사람들로 이렇게 이루어졌는데 그런 이질적인 요소들이 모여서 어 그런 다양성이 하나의 새로운 신안이라는 이 용광로 속에서 어 하나의 새로운 문화로 익혀졌고 또 각자의 다른 경험들이 어 그런 다양한 경험들이 신안을 새로운 그런 창조를 문화 창조를 하는데 어 성공을 한 것이 아닌가 이렇게 그 생각을 합니다. 오늘 그두 분의 발표와 또 민희경 부사장님의 코멘트를 같이 들으면서도 나름대로 이 다양성에 기반한 창의성의 문제 오늘 주제에 대해서 생각을 좀 해봤습니다. 에, 창의성의 그 기반에 있는 것이 그 다양성인데 이 다양성이라는 것은 다른 말로 하면 어떤 구성원의 그 차이 뭐이 부분이 아닐까 생각합니다. 근데 그 다양성은 저는 두 가지로 그 정리를 하고 싶은데 하나는 에, 서피스 레벨의 그 다이버시티가 있을 수 있겠다. 예를 들어서 어, 인종이라든지 국가 간 차이라든지 또뭐 남녀 또뭐 연령 뭐 여러 가지 그러한 그 서비스 표면적인 그런 그 다양성이 있고 또 하나는 이 딥보다 딥 레벨의 그런 그 다이버시티가 있다고 생각합니다. 그것은 지식이라든지 경험이라든지 뭐또 어떤 뭐 자기가 어떤 공부를 어떻게 했다든지 이런 기술을 어떤 이런 이런 부분에 있어서의 그딥 레벨의 다이버시티가 있지 않나 싶은데 어 그런 표면적인 다양성 앞으로 말씀 표면의 다양성은 보잉이 3그 부분 관리를 잘하셨던 것 같고 이 딥보다 팀 레벨의 다양성 부분은 플립보드가 아주 작자리 그, 그런 부분들을 성공적으로 이렇게 잘 관리하고 계신 게 아닌가 싶습니다. 그런데 저희 같은 이제 큰 조직에서 이렇게 보면 그러한 그 다양성이라고 하는 것이 어 분명히 혁신에는 영향을 준다. 조직을 어 창의력을 발휘하고 조직의 혁신을 만들어가는 것은 분명히 어 거기에 영향을 준다. 왜냐하면 네트워크의 이질성이 그런 학습, 능, 학습 능력을 강화하고 어, 새로운 그이 지식의 자극을 하기 때문에 에, 혁신 변수에는 확실히 영향을 준 것은 맞는데 한편으로는 그것이 성과 변수에도 영향이 직접적으로 있느냐 바로 정의 관계에 있느냐 하는 부분에서는 어, 여러 가지 연구나 과거의 경험 이런 것들을 보아서는 그것은 혼재된 그런 그, 그 영향이 있다고 저는 에, 저희는 그렇게 생각합니다. 그래서 이 다양성의 그 다이버시티 프리미엄 다이, 다양성의 프리미엄을 만들어가기 위해서는 저 나름대로는 두 가지로의 조건이 필요하다고 생각합니다. 하나는 지식과 정보를 어떻게 
발산해내는 그런 발산 메커니즘이 조직에서 얼마나 잘 구동하고 있느냐 오늘 플립보드에서 아주 좋은 사례로 많이 말씀해 주셨습니다. 그런 면에서는 굉장히 큰 참고가 되고요. 이런 지식과 정보의 그 발산의 메커니즘 오픈성 오픈 열린 조직 문화 이렇게 표현하면 좋을 것 같은데 이런 그 발산의 메커니즘이 분명히 그 이게 필요하고 두 번째로는 그 발산의 메커니즘을 그 발산된 각종 정보와 지식과 이런 것들을 어떻게 하나로 수렴해 갈 것이냐 이 수렴의 메커니즘이 또한 또한 것이 중요하다. 조직이 커지면 커질수록 또 조직이 다양화되면 다양화될수록 그런 수렴 메커니즘이 얼마나 잘 발, 그, 그 조직 내에서 작동하고 있느냐 하는 것이 굉장히 중요하다고 생각합니다. 예를 들어서 그것은 어떻게 보면 비전 또 조직의 가치 이런 것을 얼마나 공유하고 거기에 함께 하고 있다. 제가 보기에 보잉이든 오늘 사례 만들어진 세 회사 다 이런 두 가지 어, 이 메커니즘이 잘 구동되고 있는 그런 조직의 사례가 아닌가 이렇게 생각합니다. 그래서 이런 그두 가지 측면에서 저희 신한은행의 사례만 잠깐 말씀드리고 제 발표를 마칠까 합니다. 이 발산 메커니즘을 말씀드렸는데 아까 그 여러 가지 사례를 주신 앞에서 주셨던 부분들과도 많이 유사합니다. 수평적 조직 문화 이게 굉장히 중요합니다. 이 수평 조직 문화는 기업의 규모가 커지면 커질수록 더이 부분을 어떻게 그 만들고 유지하고 어 보다 더 강화시켜 날 것인가에 대한 고민이 경영자들에게는 더 많은 게 아닌가 싶은데 저희 같은 사례 보면은 의도적으로 의도적으로 조직의 위계를 금융은 원래 그 위계적인 그런 그 질서가 강한 그 조직인데 특히 은행이 그렇습니다. 그 커머셜 뱅킹의 경우에는 의도적으로 그런 그 위계를 깰수 있는 프로그램들을 많이 운영을 합니다. 그래서 저희가 모토로 하는 것이 일 잘하고 잘 노는 문화, 노는 프로그램들을 많이 만들어 갑니다. 그래서 어떤 데 보면 노는 일이 일보다 더 많다는 느낌이 들 때도 있는데, 뭐 호프데이라든지 뭐 등산대, 뭐 이런 여러 가지 다양한 프로그램, 또 직원끼리 어떤 행사 이런 것도 굉장히 장려를 많이 하고 있고요. 그런 의도된 문화 이벤트를 아주 장려하고 있고. 조직 운영 면에서는 수시로 TFT를 운영합니다. 그러니까 굉장히 유연한 조직을 운영합니다. 제가 이제 조직도 담당하고 있는데 저는 저희 그 본부 조직을 장차로는 TFT형 조직으로 바꿔나가고 합니다. 지금 뭐 기존의 펑크셔널한 조직은 구성되어 있지만 그 펑크셔널 조직을 해결할 수 없는 문제들이 너무 많고 또 거기에서 그 교류되는 정보와 지식이 제한되어 있기 때문에 그, 그 벽을 넘어서는 어 공간의 벽만이 아니라 지식의 벽을 넘어서 하나로 묶어주는 그런 TFT 활동을 지금도 수십 개 TFT가 이렇게 돌아가고 있습니다. 거기에는 다양한 직급 또 다양한 출신 다양한 경험을 가진 사람들이 참여를 해서 수시로 결과분들을 어, 만들어내고 있습니다. 또 하나의 그 열린 그 수평적 조직 문화의 그 특성으로 하나 말씀드리고 싶은 것은 어, 저희가 어, 저희 그 신한행 직원들은 모여서 이야기를 하면 이 입만 이렇게 살아있다 이런 얘기를 들을 정도로 이 토론 문화가 굉장히 강합니다. 에, 얼마 전에 저희 이제 외부에서 그 새로운 그 피로 수혈, 수혈, 수혈된 그런 간부 한 분이 계셨는데 에, 그분이 다른 금융기관에 오신 분입니다. 그분이 저한테 그 말씀하시기를 어, 자기가 밖에서 봤을 때는 신한행이 굉장히 좀 특이하고 뭔가 아주 좀 혁신적이고 이렇게 생각을 했다. 그러면서 와서 궁금했다. 뭐가 신안을 그렇게 비치게 만드는 것일까 고민됐다. 근데 막상 들어와서 보니까 처음에는 잘 모르겠더라. 자기가 있던 회사와 크게 다른 걸 모르겠더라. 이렇게. 왜냐하면 금융은 거의 비슷하거든요. 이렇게. 그런데 조금 지나고 나서 보니까 아 결정적으로 다른 부분을 알았다. 그게 뭡니까? 라고 제가 물어봤습니다. 그때 얘기가 자기가 토론을 여러분들 참여해 보니까 토론의 문화가 완전히 다르더라. 저희는 토론할 때만큼은 격렬하게 이렇게 그 싸웁니다. 상대방의 의견, 내 의견이 격렬하게 부딪히고 그것이 교리되고 하는 이런 문화를 가지고 있습니다. 그런데 그분이 말씀하시길 더 이상한 것은 거의 싸움하듯이 토론하고 난 다음에 일어나서 나갈 때는 다 웃으면서 손잡고 나가고 즐거워하더라라는 참 그게 독특, 독특하게 자기는 느꼈다. 저는 저는 은행에서만 같은 조직에서만 30여 년을 살았기 때문에 잘안 보이던 부분이 다른 조직에서 오신 분은 그거를 쉽게 느끼더라고요. 그 그렇지 그렇게 토론은 격렬하게 한다. 그리고 내려진 결정에 대해서는 같이 추진한 이런 문화가 여기 저희는 들어가 있습니다. 그런 수평 그런 그 토론의 장에서는 위아래가 없고 또 그런 계급이라든지 이런 질서를 깬 그런 토론이 저희는 그 벌어진 그런 문화를 어, 가지고 있습니다. 아까 그 클리포드 사장님께서 그이 열린 공간의 문제를 말씀하셨는데 예, 저희 사례도 하나를 말씀드리면 저희는 본점이 서울 시내 중심에 있는 승례문 옆에 예, 본점이 대한항공 상공회의소와 사이에 본점이 있습니다. 땅값으로 치면 굉장히 비싼 땅입니다. 거기에 
15층 한 층을 전층을 저희 그 크리에이티브 공간으로 다 바꿔놨습니다. 어, 그 안에 들어가 보면 어, 회의실이 각종 형태의 회의실이 들어가 있습니다. 동그란 방, 네모난 방, 각진 방, 어떤 방은 신발 벗고 들어가서 맨발로 이렇게 편하게 할수 있는 방, 또 어떤 방은 어, 영화나 보고 음악 들으면서 할수 있는 그런 방, 뭐그 다양한 예, 또 어떤 방은 유리처럼 밖에서 다 보이는 방 이런 다양한 형태의 방들이 있습니다. 그러다가 그 토론하다가 잘안 되면 그, 그 밖에 나가서 두 사람끼리 디베이트가 붙을 일이 있다 그러면 둘이 디베이트할 수 있는 공간이 별도로 만들어져 있겠다든지 또그 바깥에는 어, 편하게 그 남, 숙녀문과 남산을 바라보면서 차를 마시면서 리프레시할 수 있는 그런 그, 그, 그 카페도 마련되어 있고 카페 옆에는 각종 도서와 잡지가 비치되어 있는 어, 도서실 옆에 같이 붙어 있고 그러한 공간 한 층을 전체를 다 크리에이티브 공간으로 그 오픈을 해서 그 안에 지금 초 토요일 일요일까지도 직원들이 자발적으로 와서 그 방들을 꽉꽉 채웁니다. 그래서 야, 이, 이, 이렇게 그이 혁신에 대한 열정 또이 이, 이런 부분도 있는 거를 우리가 앞으로 조금 더잘 관리하고 그런 그 창의 공간을 더욱 만들어 환경적으로도 더 많은 뒷받침을 해야 되겠다는 생각을 하고 있습니다. 뭐 이런 정도로 발산 메커니즘 중에 뭐 사례를 말씀드리고요. 수렴 메커니즘 쪽에서의 사례를 말씀드렸고 이것은 조직 문화에 있어서 조직 비전을 어떻게 공유하고 핵심 가치를 어떻게 전파할 것인가 뭐 이런 부분입니다. 이 부분은 저희가 창립 때부터 아주 그 강하게 추진해왔던 부분이기 때문에 지금 전 직원이 오히려 너무 강력한 조직 문화가 창의 혁신을 방해하는 것이 아닐까 싶을 정도의 그런 그 강력한 문화를 가지고 있습니다. 그런데 그, 그것이 가능하게 된 것은 그런 것을 상징한 상징적인 문화 기동 장치들이 저희는 내부에 여러 개를 그 구동시키고 있습니다. 에, 예를 들어서 매년 연초에 그 종합 업적 평가 대회라는 그전 직원이 참석하는 참가하는 그런 그 행사가 있습니다. 에, 올림픽 그 공원에 있는 체조 경기장에 전 직원 만 삼천 명 직원이 다 들어갑니다. 그래서 그다 들어가서 그 시간만큼은 그 원래는 성과에 대한 평가하고 표창하는 자리지만 축제 그 장으로 되고. 그 축제의 장 속에서 1년간 우리가 지향하고자 했던 비전과 가치를 잘 구현한 사람들에 대한 시상과 또 축하하는 그런 자리들을 갖는 등 이런 그 문화기동 장치들을 저희는 잘 활용하고 있습니다. 또 어, 그러면서도 가족 간의 어떤 가족적 유대 관계 이 부분 유대 의식 이것이 굉장히 그 중요하기 때문에 저희는 배우자 초청 행사라든지 오늘 수능 시험 날인데. 에드 콘서트라고 하는 것을 그 가족 자녀들과 같이 해서 하는 그런 콘서트도 해주고 또 가족 힐링 프로그램 에, 이런 뭐 여러 가지 가족과 같이 하는 프로그램 또 직원 간의 팀워크를 강화하는 그런 프로그램 이런 너무, 너무나 많은 그런 프로그램들이 지금 그 돌아가고 그 있습니다. 뭐 그러나 무엇보다 더 중요한 실험의 메커니즘은 역시 에, 이 CEO와 또 리더와 그 리더십 타 차원에서의 소통 이 부분이 가장 중요하다고 생각하는데 지금 온라인, 오프라인 쪽에 특히 온라인 쪽에서의 소통은 상당히 그 활발하게 되었습니다. 저희는 광장 2.0이라는 이름으로 만들어 놓고 있는데 거기에 금년도에 올라온 그 혁신과 창의 아이디어가 만천 건이 이제 넘습니다. 그래서 이거를 수렴하고 그걸 조직에 반영하는 그런 일들이 본부에 굉장히 중요하고 큰 그런 역할 중에 그 하나고. 어, 직원들이 가지고 있는 지식과 아이디어 이것을 표출하고 조직에 반영시키는 그런 프로그램을 하나 소개드리면 커뮤니타, 커뮤니타스 대회라고 하는 게 있습니다. 커뮤니티가 어떤 법적인 공동체를 얘기한다면 커뮤니타스라고 하는 것은 저희는 그걸 감성이 교류되는 공동체 이런 표현으로 저희 나름대로 쓰고 있는 용어인데 그 커뮤니타스 대회라는 걸 열어서 거기는 우리 직원들이 직구 갈 관계 없이 직원들이 제안을 하고 배안 경진대 발표를 합니다. 다음 주에 이제 최종 결선이 있는데 거기서 채택했던 아이디어들이 시행이 되고 하는 그런 것들이 아주 활발하게 이렇게 이루어지고 있고 한 가지 더 강조해 말씀드리면 이러한 모든 과정에 이런 커뮤니케이션 과정에 반드시 그 저희가 빠지지 않고 참여시키는 멤버들은 역시 현장의 고객 접점에서 그 있는 현장의 직원들은 반드시 이런 모든 프로그램 등에 다 TFT든 이런 그 행사든 다 반드시 같이 하게 됩니다. 그래서 현장 의견을 저희가 현장의 그런 고객, 고객님들의 그 변화, 고객님들의 의견 이런 것들이 반영이 될수 있는 그런 프로그램들로 운영해 나가고 있습니다. 에 제가 오늘 그 발표를 보고서 그것을 어이 이런 다양성, 이 다양성을 창의성으로 이렇게 그 승화시키기 위한 그런 메커니즘으로서 발산의 메커니즘과 수류 메커니즘을 두 가지로 정리를 정리를 해봤는데 이두 가지 메커니즘 모두 다 작, 
함께 잘 작동되는 것이 중요하다고 생각하고 매니지먼트 리더십이란 결국 이것을 관리하는 것이 아닐까 이렇게 생각합니다. 어, 오늘 여기 나오신 그 회사 모두 어, 이런 그 메커니즘이 잘 어, 구동되고 있는 회사라고 생각하고 그런 그 성공의 밑바탕이 이런 게 있지 않았나 싶고 저희 또한 어, 지금 한것 이상으로 더욱 더 노력하게 하겠습니다. 고맙습니다. Thank you, uh, EVP Mr. Lee. So I think Mr. Lee really summarized all, all these uh, presenters' uh, key point and ideas. And if you see from bank to uh, small venture company to medium-sized IT industry, also defense and commercial jet, also food industry, every industry, we are really uh, fostering these innovation. And these, all these innovation, they come through a uh, people, but also the company try to uh, making an organizational structure to really enhancing all these uh, creative idea coming from every person in the organization. Uh, we have about a 30 minute uh, for Q&A. Actually, we are supposed to have 20 minutes, but there is some over on. Let's give your uh, floor a chance to give a question to presenter or discussant. Raise your hand. And also, uh, please give me just a little introduction of yourself first, and then give us questions. In the middle. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your uh, presentation. Uh, uh, my name is Hyun Jin Lim. I'm working in, in the human resource month of the joint venture between Dow Chemical and SKC. Uh, uh, I just uh, want to, uh, I would like to give the question, uh, question Mr. Eric Alexander, sir. So uh, before asking some question, I would like to explain the Korean situation and culture, uh, cultural situation. Uh, first thing, uh, Korean people, uh, normally, uh, long time live together only Korean with the Korean people. In U.S., uh, variety variety of people who has a, a variety of uh, religion, race. Anyway, variety of people live together and work together. So, uh, I think, in my opinion, uh, to work uh, with a uh, to work uh, with a variety variety of people to collaborate. Uh, the uh, uh, U.S. people have to understand other people's cultural uh, uh, backgrounds uh, and educational situation or other kind of kind of things. But in Korean people, uh, it is not uh, less critical to understand other people's background for the world. And second thing, uh, second thing, normally Korean people educate uh, have have been educated that. Uh, we should follow seniors' opinion to uh, oppose the seniors' opinion or disagree with seniors' uh, order. It is a kind of the rude behavior. In, uh, it's only kind of the current, uh, so not, uh, how can I say? It, anyway, not a normal situation, but sometimes uh, uh, that kind of the behavior cons uh, is considered as uh, some rude things. Uh, third things, uh, many Korean people has uh, some fear to the dis uh, uh, for the discussion because uh, it, uh, I think it's uh, 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 it's caused by the uh, Korean education system. Uh, for example, I was in a student. Uh, I already uh, I just familiar with uh, some uh, delivered from the knowledge from uh, I just. Uh, we have no uh, rare opportunity to discuss with the other other students. Only just delivered from the na, uh, delivered na, uh, the delivered uh, knowledge is delivered from the te teachers or tutors. We have uh, rare op rare opportunity. We has rare opportunity to discuss other students or teachers. I think that kind of the things uh, things are uh, uh, interfere to f foster. Uh, in, uh, creative for the organization. So, uh, your companies uh, have uh, some variety programs to foster creative and make a good uh, working place. So, 
I would like to ask you, uh, could you recommend some uh, specific program or best practice to the, for appropriate this kind of the strict and strictly and unflexible organization? Sure, it's a long question, so I'll try to give it a, a, as good of an answer as I can. Um, I think, um, as Joe mentioned, I think when I go to your second question, um, it is a challenge in Korea. I mean, let's be very honest. The culture is, as you said, I think it's very difficult. I do a lot of work in Korea with many different companies, and I see it all the time. I, you know, ranging from, I may see J.K. Shin, the CEO of Samsung Mobile, and have access to him, but then work with much more junior employees in a company like Samsung. Um, with a lot of the publishers, I see um, this type of, of behavior where, some of the people on the ground doing the real work have brilliant ideas. And um, actually their ideas differ from their seniors. And the culture itself, I think it's a challenge. As Joe said, I think um, it's difficult sometimes to get those ideas across. And I think it's just, it's inherent in the Korean culture. And it's not just Korea, I mean this is across the world you see this, where um, Silicon Valley has this very unique, um, where again, we really encourage. I, while I don't love it when one of my employees or one of the workers at work says, well, Eric, that's a stupid idea. If they're right, they're right, and I listen to them. And, um, and so I think that, you know, I think it's just something that um, this comes from management. This comes from all of us sitting up here that have to implement these policies um, at the companies and really encourage people to challenge our thinking. Um, and it's not rude behavior to challenge your superior. Um, it's the right thing to do. Um, sometimes, you know, youth and naivete um, not knowing is the best answer because I think that um, sometimes when people have been in the same role for 20 years, um, they, um, they're, they're used to a certain way and they're used to having people you know, tell them they like what they're doing and I think you have to challenge that. I think it comes from both sides. I think you have to have managers that are open to it, but I think it has to come from people like you that constantly push the envelope. And so I think that that's you know, really important, it comes to you know, everyone in the room that works at a company has to challenge that thinking and, you know, it, it'll change eventually. It will be, as long as that behavior is rewarded and you have forward thinking managers, like everyone up here on this panel, I think once that behavior gets rewarded, it will change and then the next generation of management encourages it more and more. Um, but you gotta push and sometimes you're gonna get in trouble. And sometimes trouble's a good place to be for a company, actually, um, in my opinion. I think it's okay. Um, on the first question you asked me about understanding other, um, other cultures, I think, you know, interestingly in the U.S., like I mentioned Flipboard, we have probably 20 different countries represented working in Flipboard, and it is really important. Um, you know, these aren't people that work around the world. These are all, you know, people from Korea that work in Palo Alto, people from China that work in Palo Alto. Um, and it, um, it has been really important for us to understand each other um, uh, in order to get things done. And I went too long in my presentation, but there were some more slides I was gonna show you where we really treat the company like a family. And it's a very diverse family with a bunch of adopted children. And these children come from all over the world. They come, again, from China. And we do things like have, um, uh, you know, grills at lunchtime where um, every day people can go to the store, buy food, and we have a big barbecue. And people can sit down and it's great because like simple things like um, everyone's a huge fan of Korean barbecue and Flipboard because a lot of times uh, some of the Korean like Song will bring or some of or Young Bin might bring uh, marinated uh, uh, um, Kalbi or something and grill it. And it's just fun things like that that make understanding each other's culture uh, uh, Dion, who, who would bring food from Indonesia. Um, it's this really interesting thing where I think understanding each other's culture is super, super important, 
and um, it's how we get things done. Um, you you talk to people differently, but you know, you guys don't. Um, obviously, here in Korea, it's you, you have many different cultures as well. But I think in the U.S., especially Silicon Valley, we have so many. It's mandated that you have to understand how other people work, how they live, and. Um, and um, and so I, I think it's really important um, to do that. I think, uh, like I said, for you guys, um, I think you do have a diverse culture, but it is a mainly Korean workforce in a lot of the companies, I would say. And so, um, you know, working to kind of achieve some of the things like challenging authority and making sure that's accepted, I think is the best thing you can do across the board. Um, does that answer your question? Thank you, thank you, Eric. So I think this question is a uh, very core question. So I'd like to ask a uh, Vice President EVP, Mr. Lee, as Shinan, you already explained how you really uh, forced uh, all these uh, open innovation and uh, a lot of debate, making a decision on point of debate from high and low. Uh, how can you achieve this, really? With, uh, how, what kind of process in place really making these uh, ideas come up from High and low. Everybody can openly say about debating about the topic. Uh, the beginning is education. We started from 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 동등하게 입장으로 이렇게 들어오게 됩니다. 그러면 거기서 계속 저희가 교육상에서 강조하는 것이 그러한 그 토론과 그 토론의 의견을 수렴하고 그것을 하나로 묶고 하나가는 그런 풀, 훈련을 계속 저희 창립 초기부터 계속 해왔고 거기에는 저희의 CEO가 그 역, 중요한 역할을 이제 CEO부터 같이 참여한 CEO가 참여할 경우에는 CEO 또한 똑같은 레벨에서 똑같은 입장에서 저희 아까 민경 부사장님께서는 이제 님 이렇게 부르신다고 했는데 그냥 저희는 연선에 들어간 선생님이라고 서로 간에 호칭하는 그런 문화가 있었는데 그로부터 초기 문화부터 이렇게 확실하게 그 토론을 중요시하고 의견의 의견을 갖게 하고 그 의견을 교류하게 하는 것 의견을 가질 것과 의견의 교류 이두 가지를 가장 중요한 문화 요소로 저희는 생각을 해왔고 그런 것들을 장려하는 것을 시작은 연순이고 연 교육 과정이고 그것이 현업에 와서 TFT 과정에 또는 현업에서 고객 응대 과정에 지정 운영 브랜치 운영의 과정에 이런 모든 부분에서 그 스며들도록 하는 그런 그 노력들을 계속 했습니다. 그래서 제가 가장 중요한 중요한 것이 그래서 창의성의 문제에 있어서. 의견을 가질 것 이것이 중요합니다. 특히 우리 한국의 아까 지적의 질문에 말씀해 주시면은 우리가 그, 그 상사로부터 지시받는 데 익숙해 있다 보니까 자기 생각 갖기보다는 지시의 길을 기다리는 대기 상태에 있는 어, 그런 부분들을 저희는 가장 그 경계를 했습니다. 그거를 저희 문화 용어로 보면 대명 상태의 생이다. 대명 상태, 명을 기다리는 상태의 인생을 살 것이냐 아니다. 우리 조직은 내 스스로가 만들어서 그 주인 의식이라는 걸로 그 오너십으로 저희는 그걸 승화를 시켜서 지금 핵심 가치 하나가 그 오너십이 돼 있는데 어, 그러한 그 아직 자기 스스로가 내 조직을 만들어가는 데 있어서 의견, 당신은 어떤 의견을 가지고 있느냐 그것을 그 갖게 하고 그리고 그것을 교류하게 하고 그것을 결론을 만들어가고 실천해 나가는. 그런 트레이닝을 계속해 왔다 어떤 점을 강조하고 싶습니다. Thank you, Mr. Lee. So, because of time, I have to wrap up uh, today's uh, discussion. Uh, thank you again to extinguished uh, speakers and panelists. Give them a big hand first. So in every industry, whether in IT or uh, defense ministry or food and beverage or creative industry or even in banking, every company tried to making a workplace, a better place for a creativity and inno innovation. The way they approach those is a different, but uh, in the core center of these uh, creativity and innovation is the people. So what uh, Scott said, people first, these people who are really the core of all these uh, creative, uh, creativity and innovation and idea. Thank you for your coming. Thank you for your enjoying this session. Thank you again. Thanks, HS. Mm -hmm.